I want to introduce Jim McAndrew real quick. So Jim is a local Austinite here. Jim was the original author of Auto Flight Logic, right? Well, how many years ago? As end of 2014. End of 2014. I actually met him. Uh, it was Randy Braun, who's a DJI uh, rep, came out to Austin, did a meetup, and that's where I met Jim for the first time. He was demoing Auto Flight Logic. And at that time, we had never seen really this sort of autonomous flight. Tell me if I'm getting this right. But I remember you doing a demo where one drone was chasing another. I was like, when? <laughs> nobody's yeah. touching the stick. He went on to sell that technology to a company that then he was CTO of for a while. And now he's out on his own with a new company. And basically, I'll give you the 10-second the version, and then he'll give you the really long version. The 10-second version is, if you want to get a shot right the first time, you program it with his software, and then you go push one button, and the drone does it all by itself perfectly, and you can pre everything. So, yeah. Jim Thank McAndrew. You. Thank you, yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, yeah, so my name's Jim, and I live here in Austin. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing this thing with drones since the end of 2014. I was that guy that Scott was talking about that, you know, got on the sticks and quickly reached my limitations, and I wished his product was available uh, back then. It wasn't, and so I turned to the next thing that I know how to do, which is programming. Uh, I've, you know, I've been programming for a long time. Um, I just shaved off all my gray hair, so you guys can't see it, but I'm actually older than you think, Carlos. Uh, so, anyways, back then it was kind of the wild west, early days of the DJI SDK. Um, it was like their first release, Alpha Launch 1.0. There was no documentation. It was. You know, it was pretty rough. A lot of this stuff was, you know, you'd, you'd set a bully into true and it should be false. By the way, they, they, there's a little uh, connection issue. Scott's going to work on it. You keep uh, talking and then we'll get over to your computer. Did it just crash? Yeah, there we go. I think it just went to sleep. Cool. You got it, Hondo? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that was, you know, at the end of 2014, and the idea was how can I just. At that time, it was like they didn't even have follow mode, you know. And I was big into action sports. I've been doing that all my life. You know, I grew up on the lake and was wakeboarding, went snowboarding all the time. And I just wanted to put my iPhone in my pocket, put the drone up, and have the thing follow you. Which, of course, nowadays with like SkyDio two and all this crazy tech, it's it's a different world. But back then, that was innovative. And so that was the original idea behind Autopilot, which was the app that I created. And you know, I, I in my naivete, I decided to develop a flight controller because that's what you had to do at the time. DJI didn't give you any access in their SDK to the onboard flight controller. So sat down the first couple weeks of January and just started doing trig and calculus and dusting off my old textbooks from school. And I wrote the algorithm, uh, at least the first cut of it. And it, it worked well enough to say, well, maybe I should release this app on the App Store. And that's when I hooked up with the DJI guys. Um, and as soon as it launched, it was sort of off to the races. Uh, it got a ton of downloads, and I started getting requests from people. Uh, they wanted to use it for a bunch of different use cases that were beyond what I originally had intended it for, um, all the way into like you know pre-planning waypoint missions and stuff like that. And so that's where Autopilot was up until the end of 2015. And then I decided to join up with a couple of guys here in town uh, to start Hangar, which was kind of a rebranding and a, uh, we were going to go raise venture funding and essentially create Uber for drones. And I was the CTO of Hangar until 2018. And they were recently acquired by AirMap. And then I decided to kind of go back to my roots, do another bootstrap startup. It's called DroneLink. And I wanted to pick up where I had left off on a lot of things with Autopilot, but take it to the next level. And so Things like you know only supporting iOS uh, or you know only supporting DJI or only being on mobile devices and not having a web-based mission planner or 3D pre-visualization environment. You know I wanted to approach it from the beginning to sort of holistically think about all these problems um, and solve them kind of in the right way with some with with some foresight as opposed to just like reacting and you know, slinging code, essentially, which is how Autopilot was. And so that's what DroneLink is intended to be. And I will show you a quick little video that introduces you to it. And then I want to jump in and do a demo of the software that hopefully we can get a flight that we program up and then go fly so you guys can see 
the previs versus what the actual looks like. So here is the video. Three, two, one, starting mission. DroneLink is a modern approach to flight automation focused on reusability, collaboration, scalability, and a network of drone professionals that are looking to use collaboration to enhance their craft. At its core, collaboration is all about human beings working together and sharing ideas. You get exposed to an alternate way of how somebody thinks about something. The core feature in DroneLink is components. The component is the definition of how is the drone producing the thing that is actually valuable. What I saw happening over and over again was people spending all their time and energy replanning missions just because they're changing location or they're changing drones or they're changing pilots and there was no ability to reuse any of that work. Going out and being able to press one button and seeing it take off fully autonomously and do exactly what you wanted it to do every single time. The mindset up until this point has been, how do we fly the drone from point A to point B? And the shift needs to be, how do we get the data from the drone that we need to solve the problem that we're trying to solve? When I have to think about flying the drone and rotating the camera, it's distracting. And it separates me as an artist from truly being able to express myself. I only have one chance to get that perfect shot. I put the drone down, I load up the mission, I push play, and I let the drone do its thing. Drone Link has a custom flight controller which offers multi-purpose mission types. They can do a 360, a waypoint mission, and then do an orbit, all in the exact same mission. All these ideas can be put into components, put into a library, and you can pull them and drop them directly into your mission. We can just pull this particular component and put it into the flight plan. We don't have to replan every time. To have a one-stop shop with an app to be able to pick up and take pictures of the building envelope, to map the job site, it's easily repeatable on a different site. Human error is always going to be difficult. If you have a drone operator trying to flip between apps and there's an incident, that's a problem for me as a drone service provider. DroneLink gives us the ability to repeat the same operation week to week so we can give the client consistent data. We just go out, push the button, and go. I can use the same process with the orbits, with the pictures, with the maps, with the envelope scans for any project around the country. I think the real future here is actually running the flight control in the cloud. The drone is out there flying and producing its telemetry but we're actually sending that telemetry in real time to a data center, could be halfway across the world, processing it and coming up with the commands that need to be sent back to the drone to perform the flight control and doing it with a latency that still allows you to produce the types of shots that drone link can currently do when you're standing within a couple hundred feet. Your mind has to be open enough to think about it in a different way, to challenge the status quo, and once you get past that, it's worth it. Our goal is to listen to our users and listen to the people that are pushing us to develop the best solutions that's out there, not just for today, but going forward. There's that spark inside of us, that divine spark. It's our creativity. It's our ability to imagine things that don't exist yet and make them reality. Drone link's no different. You want to do that with your drone. You want to do that with everything in your life. So that's the, that's the flashy version, so now we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Um, so if you go actually to dronelink.com, and you, I would actually recommend that you guys do this right now if you want to, because uh, one of the things that you were seeing in the video is like as I was editing the mission plan, what's built into DroneLink and the way that I was talking about the collaboration is if you have a mission plan that's in a public repository, anybody can actually discover that. And then you can open that mission plan, and then while I'm editing it, you can watch what I'm doing in real time. And it automatically synchronizes to your devices. And so, um, you know, like what I'll, I'll show you what I'm doing right here, and then you guys can follow along if you want to. Um, and part of that is our pricing. So if you click get started here, so we're going after four tar four target markets. One is uh, just the hobbyists and recreational flyers, which it sounds like there's a lot of you guys in the crowd here. Um, and so I made the decision to make that free to everybody. Um, and if you are using it professionally or commercially, then it's $100 per year per user. 
And if you're a part of like a drone service provider or an internal drone service department that has multiple team members, you can then sign up for our team plan. And then if you're a large enterprise uh, that wants to actually take the same technology that I built the drone link app on top of and our back end, you can actually take that white label it and put it into your own app and your own solution uh, to have it power your specific point solution for the market vertical you're going after. Um, and you know, just before we uh, jump, you guys can click on the free plan here uh, to follow along with me as you're signing up. But uh, before we jump into the demo that I'm gonna do, I was just gonna pull up on the website our examples page. So if you see example mission plans. So drone link can be used for a lot of things. Uh, you know, my experience at Hangar was definitely more focused on commercial and industrial applications, which were things like tower inspections and facade scanning, aircraft inspections and stuff like that, uh, even job sites. The early days with autopilot, it was very much more about cinematography. And so I think what is probably going to make more sense to demo here is the cinematography aspect of it. But I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of what some of these inspection types could look like so you could just get a feel. Uh, for example, like this Eiffel Tower one here. If you open that up, this is in one of our public repositories. And so once you have your account, you can either get to it by going to our website or you can click on this little hamburger menu up here and go to public repositories. And DroneLink has a bunch of repositories that we've published. And you can think of these as just folders that you can store your mission plans and your components in. Or you can go over to the Most Stars tab and see other people in our community, um, like there's Carlos right there, that have created their own public repositories and see kind of what they're up to and share ideas. And so in this case, uh, under like the Landmarks repository, that's where that Eiffel Tower mission plan is. And so when you pull that up, this is what you see to start with, which is, you know, it's, it's somewhat interesting. Um, and there's a new take kind of on the idea of what an orbit could be. Um, I've got the advanced settings expanded here. But in this idea, you can have things like a starting altitude and a final altitude, a starting radius and a final radius, um, and end up with this producing this corkscrew type of mission, which is super hard to do uh, you know, manually. Maybe with the three axis controller, it would be a lot easier. Uh, but in this case, what you can do is you can turn on the simulated drone, and you can see it in 3D. So if we zoom out here, there it is. But of course, there is one big missing component here, obviously the Eiffel Tower that should be standing in the middle there. Uh, and I am working on getting Google Earth integrated directly into the browser here so that we have that. Until then, what you can do, this is kind of part of the workflow of creating these mission plans is you can run a mission preview. When you click on that button, what's actually happening is going back to that comment I made about wanting to design it to be cross-platform, vendor agnostic, operating system agnostic from the beginning, I wrote the flight controller in a language that allows me to run the same exact code on iOS and Android, and in fact, in the browser right there, or even on the server like I was talking about in the video. And so it's not just sort of a guesstimate of what's going to happen. It's like the actual flight control code that ran there when it was running the preview. It went so fast, you probably didn't see it. Um, but what's going on is, since I'm in the browser and I'm doing it as a preview, I don't have to run the flight controller in real time. I can actually just rail the processor and run it as fast as possible. So in this case, what's a 12 minute and 33 second mission, I was able to simulate that effectively in about three seconds. And so you can imagine when you're going through this process of creating these plans, the, it's, a, it's an iterative process where you create something, you run the preview, you see if it's what you wanted, it's not what you wanted, you go back, you edit it, you run the preview again, and then what happens is, is you end up getting 100 cycles of running this mission in a matter of like 10 or 15 minutes. It's, I mean, it's, it's like a game changer. There's no, way, there's no way you can do that in the real world in real time. It's too costly and too prohibitive. And so in this case, we've got the preview, you can hit play on the preview, let it play out here, and you can see I've got a timeline view down here in the bottom. I've got the 2D map view up here in the left. I've got some information about what the flight controller was doing at that point during the mission. And then, of course, you have the 3D view in the top right. Um, and then down here in the timeline, you can see 
okay, it's approaching the orbit. Um, once it finishes approaching the orbit, then it gets into the orbit. And then these are all the commands that are happening with the camera. Uh, you know, I was doing things like setting the interval. I'm doing an interval capture here. So in fact, if I turn on, like these are where all the photos are gonna be doing this tower scan in this case. Um, and so you can see once it starts the orbit, it executes this camera command right here, camera start capture, and then it's showing you, here's capture 17, 18, all the way over to, this is gonna take 366 photos. And this is a one battery mission. You can change that, uh, you know, if you say, maybe for some reason my battery's only gonna last for 10 minutes or something like that, and then it'll re-perform the estimation of how many batteries this mission is gonna take and when you're gonna have to do the swap. And then if you keep scrolling down, it'll show you other things like what's your altitude, how far is the drone away from you, what's its horizontal speed, its vertical speed, et cetera. And so uh, once you kind of lock in all the parameters that you want, then you hit the export to Google Earth button right here. And when you open that up here, here it is in Google Earth. Looks like a big Christmas tree. And we can take this turn off the capture markers so we can see what's going on here. And there it is, your orbit around the Eiffel Tower. And what's happening here is this 3D uh, view actually has the ground elevation in there. And so when you set this takeoff location, I'm actually restricting it that it has to be within 20 feet of that point. It'll know the altitude of the ground at that point. It knows the altitudes of where the Eiffel Tower is. And then that's how, whenever you export it to the KMZ file for Google Earth, it knows ex that's exactly where it's gonna be. And you can zoom in there and see that the flight path is safe. It's not running into the tower. And then the final thing is, what is the framing going to look like? Is your field of view correct? And so then you can click on the flight motion and then watch it actually play out here. You can either watch it play out in real time or you can speed it up. It's like, uh, hang on, let me restart Google Earth here. Okay. So if we go back to that flight motion. There we go. And then you can speed it up if you want to make sure that's the exact framing that you want. So in cases like, what's that? Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So uh, that's kind of a more inspection focused one. I mean, obviously that could be um, based for cinematography. Um, I like this Neuschwanstein Castle one uh, personally for the more cinematic uh, viewpoints. So in this case, Here's Neuschwanstein Castle, uh, south of Munich. And you know, this could be one of those cases where uh, you get the permit to fly this thing and you're going to fly all the way to Germany and you have like, your, your permit is like, you, you, they're giving you 15 minutes. You cannot, like you have to get it right the first time. You only have one shot. And this is particularly complicated because of course, you're gonna be taking off from down here in this field and the castle's 550 feet above you and you know, it's, it's just, there's no, you couldn't have done this before, not even in an autopilot. Um, and so again, running the mission preview here. We export this one to Google Earth. There we go. It's a 10 minute mission. Here it is. And I'm even showing off a little bit here. So I had planned this mission originally to be nice and far away from the mountain and just do a big sweeping panoramic shot in front of it. And then in fact, right here, there's a 360 photo that I'll explain here in a second that's taking 23 pictures. But then once I implemented this feature to export to Google Earth, uh, I started to get a little bit more bold and being able to do things like proving that this flight path is safe. Uh, you're literally flying through the ravine that's behind the castle over this bridge for this completely epic shot. So if you 
run that flight motion out. Here's the original, just kind of mundane, <laughs> mundane if you could call it that, flying in front of the castle. Uh, and then as you speed it up, here we come. Now it's going to start doing the 360 photo frames. So watch that for a second. Boom. It's flying, approaching the location of the 360 photo. And it reaches there, points the gimbal up, and then these are representative of each of the frames that it's taking. And then after it takes the 360 photo, that's when it flies over here into this valley, drops down, and get to that Disney castle look. Um, so there's obviously there's a lot of stuff going on there, um, but one of the things that I, I kind of glossed over was that, you know, traditional apps, even like autopilot, were very much focused on like, automation is all about like waypoint mode, right? You see that in Litchi and autopilot and things. Um, what I wanted to do is I actually wanted to create these mission types that were multi-purpose like Eric was talking about in the video. And so, you know, there, there's a, what you might consider to be like a classic kind of waypoint mode motion at the beginning, but then it follows it up with a 360 photo, which would have been like pano mode and autopilot. And then it follows it up with another waypoint mission after that that goes down. And so the idea was chaining these things together and we call that components. And what's great about architecting things in that way, um, I mean, one, one of the issues, and part of the reason why most of the other apps do it the way they do is because the DJI SDK, uh, that's how it's built if you want to use their flight controller. Since we're not limited by that, I wrote my own flight, flight controller again. Um, it was, how can we sort of break out of that mold and think about things a little bit more holistically. Um, and of course, it's even more relevant to the guys that are doing like repetitive scans of a job site every single week that, you know, they're doing an image series and 360 photos and ortho mosaic and all these things. They want to chain all those things together and have it be in one mission, even if it's like a five battery mission. And so what happens is, is like on those team accounts that I was talking about, you could have a pilot show up, he flies it, and then he's out of batteries or he has to leave after two hours. He leaves and then the next team member shows up. It's the mission, the progress is saved in that team account and the next guy can show up, load the same mission, pick back up with a different drone and finish the mission. Um, and so like the, the reason it's like that is, you know, what, what you find out is that when you solve for like doing battery swapping and having it, you know, getting the drone back to the same kinematic state and getting all the cameras and, you know, the gimbals and all the settings that happened right up to that state in the same state, it's like not any harder to allow the battery swap to be like across time or across pilots or across drones. And so it, it just, it, um, it's kind of a game changer, especially for like those um, more regional or larger drone service providers. So having said that, I do want to get into actually doing one of these missions. So let's come back over to the app, and I'm going to, if you have an account, I'm going to do it in our demo repository here. So if you go click on the hamburger and go to public repositories, you'll see demo is one of them. I've got the demo from the Austin drone meetup that I did before. And if we come over to where we're at, Okay, so I'm going to do a new plan here, and I think that maybe this is that little outside that door right there. Maybe we're about right here. So I'm going to say that's the takeoff location. I'll call it spin up 2019, and you guys should see that now in the demo repo that you can open up, and then. Uh, I'm restricting the takeoff area. It's not as important in an area that doesn't have as much elevation change. Um, but this is this is kind of a critical setting, especially if you're in a mountainous area, because the takeoff point is where it sets your drone's altimeter. Um, and then it gives you a choice. Do you want to do an orbit? Do you want to do a path? Do you want to do a map? Do you want to fly to a destination? Uh, so in this case, I'm going to do a path, which is kind of similar to a waypoint mission in other systems. And we'll say that we want maybe the path to start right here at 100 feet and it automatically created a couple waypoints for me. I'm not gonna fly that direction. I'm gonna drag these over here. Hey Jeff, 
quick yeah. question. If somebody had this software and wanted to fly this mission with their own drone right after we go outside, can they do it? Yeah, absolutely. So in the little dot, dot, dot menu here, you just hit copy and put it into one of your own repositories, and then it'll be available for you in the app to fly it. So we'll see who's the brave one to do it first. Yeah, um, cool. So we've got the Waypoint mission right here. So the, the first idea is we want to kind of lay out the flight path in terms of the X, Y axis. Um, and then the next thing would be the Z axis. And the way that you change that, you know, in other systems, you do it on a Waypoint. In our system, we have what's called markers. And so the thought is, is Waypoints are less important. Components are sort of the primary object that you think about things in. And so we're deprioritizing Waypoints. And because of that, in, way, in this path component, what you want to do is you want to use the least number of waypoints to, to make it the least complexity in terms of mission planning um, to accomplish the flight path that you want. So I've got two waypoints there. And let's say that since I started at 100 feet, maybe I want to end up at uh, 200 feet. So I can put down a new marker just by right clicking. And then it gives me options. Here I can say, for example, the altitude. I could say maybe I want that to end up at 200 feet. Now, if I turn on the simulated drone here, it'll show me right now in real time, that's what that flight path is going to look like. And I can even do things like, maybe I want it to be even more cinematic so I can actually change the interpolation curve to like a sigmoid and I can shape that. So this is what the shape's gonna look like, which is gonna be a more natural, like if I was hand flying it, that's probably more what it would look like. Um, and then once I have the z-axis done, then the question becomes, you can see actually the simulated drone now here is, they're tied together, right? So I can drag this guy around in 2D, move this here. And if I wanted to, I could actually create a new waypoint based on the view over here. I could say like a new waypoint plus marker and it would drop that down and it would have where the simulated drone currently is plus the current field of view, which by the way is accurate to the drone that you have. I have a Mavic 2 Pro. Uh, like we could do full FOV, for example, so it crops it. Um, and then uh, you can turn actual field of view on or off. So like that's, that is exactly what you're going to see if you have a Mavic 2 in full FOV. Um, but let's just undo a couple of those. So there we go, we hit the undo button. And then the final thing is, is like where is the drone pointed, right? And so maybe we want to start it pointed over here. So I can say new point of interest plus marker. So it drops down a POI and puts a marker on the path that's referencing that point of interest as close on the path as it possibly can. And then finally, over here, maybe I want it to end up looking at this side of the building at the end so I can do new point of interest plus marker. And then again, the question is, between those two point of interest markers, what's the interpolation? I could turn it off and it would just stay fixed on this first part of the building over here. And then as soon as it gets to this point on the path, number three, it would whip over. But I want it to be smooth so I can select this linear interpolation. And then we can run the preview to see if this is what we want it to be. So we just hit generate preview. This is a super short mission, so <laughs> preview it in like one second. Um, here we go. And now it's coming over here. And that's looking pretty good. But let's go ahead and do the final step, export to Google Earth. Open this up. Now here we are with the building layer. And then we can just double click the flight motion. Great. And there it is. That's exactly what we're gonna see. So we're sure. Okay, uh, but there's still one problem, right? So we've got the flight path, we've got the camera, and we've got two minutes left. Uh, and there's no way in two minutes that you could figure out how to drop all of the right camera settings in or do a 360 photo or even do one of these cool spiral orbits that I was doing. And so, um, you know, if you were going to do it yourself, like for example, while you were approaching this waypoint, you know, this path component, you could go inside to it, open up the approach, put, it a, put a component down, drop a list in, navigate into it, and do things like, you know, camera mode. You can start typing and it searches for it. You want the camera to be in video and then you can do another new component and you can say, you know, maybe the camera ISO, you want to set the ISO to something. Well, this is, it, it takes a while, right? So I'm going to cheat. And this is absolutely what you should do. Uh, instead of creating it yourself, you should include it from a repository. And so guess what? All those repositories that I was showing you that are public, including drone links, 
uh, we have things already created and other users have too. So for example, we have a cinematic camera settings component. So if I drop that in and I look at what's in there, it's doing like 15 different camera settings for me already. It's setting it into video, it's setting it to H.265 encoding, it's setting the resolution, it's setting it to D-log-M. It's doing all this stuff. And you know, some of that may be unnecessary. The drone may already be in that state, but you have no idea. You may have been flying three days ago and been doing a completely different type of mission or whatever. And it's like, how many, how many times do you go out and like, you forget to do two settings and you like ruin the entire day of like flying because you got the wrong stuff. And so this is just like peace of mind. I know I'm going to get this, the exact camera settings that I want every single time. And so I've got that in there. And then like the final thing here would be, well, what if I wanted to do a 360 photo? Including components from other people's repositories aren't just limited to like camera commands, which by the way is in any other app, like Litchi or anything else, you have to go manually do them every single time in the interface. If you wanted to do a 360 photo, like let's say we wanted to do it right over this lake, we just right click, do a new component, include from repository, search for 360, there it is, boom, 360 photo, and there you have it. It's literally fly to this point at 100 feet and it's gonna take 23 pictures. Now, this 360 photo component took us like several hours to develop, and if you, if you navigate into it, you can see it's actually pretty complicated. You're flying to a destination, you're doing multiple rows, you have multiple heading components that are at different frames, they're rotating the drone at different angles, they're rotating the gimbal, they're doing a camera capture, um, and you got all that for free, and I just dropped it in three seconds. And so now if you do the mission preview, now you'll see down here in the timeline, this is, this is what we're expecting, but there's actually still one more problem. So, and again, this is, this is why I'm going through the mission preview, right? So it's, it's a debugging step. So I can see the 23 images that it's capturing there, but I don't see the video. It's not taking the video. And so if you go look at what happens in the approach where it's setting those cinematic camera settings, there is no camera start capture. So that component was just get the camera into the state that you want it to be in, but it doesn't know when you actually want to start capturing. And so, for example, I could drop a marker down here on the path and say, that's where I want to start capturing. Or I could say maybe like once I get to the beginning of that path component, immediate, like that's when I want to start capturing. And so in that case, we call it the achieved. You've achieved the destination. And so you can just click set achieved component, start searching for start hit enter, drop it in, run the mission previewer. Boom, there's the video. It's a 32 second video. And now you can move on with your life, walk out that door and go fly it and know exactly what you're gonna get. So that's Drone Link. Thank you. All right, all right.